Hello and welcome to the Wake Up Call podcast. Today we're speaking with Mr. Stephen Kinzer about the role of regime change and how it's played into the U.S. foreign policy and his book, Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. Mr. Kinzer has covered over 50 countries on five continents and worked for the New York Times for more than 20 years, primarily as a foreign correspondent. His most recent book is The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War. You can follow his work at stephenkinzer.com, that's Stephen with a P-H and K-I-N-Z-E-R dot com. You can find him on Facebook and on Twitter at Stephen Kinzer. For more information, see the show notes page for this episode at wakeupcallpodcast.com forward slash overthrow. Stephen, welcome to the show. Good to be with you. So let's just start with a basic overview. Obviously, the book's about regime change, but what else is your book Overthrow about? The central question of American foreign policy is intervention. All of our debates really come down to that. Where in the world should the United States exercise power? What kind of power? How should it do it? Under what circumstances? What should be the necessary provocations? Uh, with what tools? So this question dominates our approach to the world, whether we're talking about the Middle East, East Asia, or any other region. How much should we intervene? Is it good for us, or, or does it harm our security interests in the long run? What I've tried to argue in my books is that these interventions often solve immediate problems, but they lay the groundwork for future problems. There are many examples over the last hundred years and more of incidents in which the United States has felt threatened or otherwise wanted to take action against um, some foreign country. We strike against them. We're able to achieve our mission in the short run by getting rid of someone we don't like and installing a friendly government. But in so doing, we actually end up undermining our own long-term security. We do things that make us feel good for a little while, but actually undermine our interests in the long run. So in addition to the pattern of uh, short-term gain but long-term consequences, uh, what are some of the other patterns you've seen in U.S. regime changes uh, over the century plus that you cover in your book and in the time since then? I see the American efforts to overthrow foreign governments as coming essentially in three different waves. Uh, the first wave was our initial burst of imperialism in the period around 1898. Uh, that was the time when we seized the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Hawaii. Uh, we became the dominant power in Cuba. We began extending our influence over the Caribbean Basin, Central America. Um, this was a time when we would just send American troops into countries to uh, impose our will. If we didn't think they were behaving the way we wanted them to, we would just invade and then we would impose a government that uh, was friendly to us. That changed in the period after World War II. Then we couldn't land the Marines in foreign countries anymore because there was a restraining factor that was the Red Army. It was the Soviet Union. We could land troops somewhere, then they might land troops, and the next thing you know, you'd spiraled up into nuclear confrontation. So we had to find another way to overthrow governments, and that was the era of covert action. Uh, the CIA was very active in these operations during the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Uh, then the third phase came with the end of the Cold War, uh, then we didn't really have to um, think about the Soviet Union anymore. We didn't have to worry about the consequences of direct invasion. So we essentially went back to Plan A, where you actually just send troops. And that was the era characterized by Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, Libya, and other countries more recently. So you see 
a different set of tactics as the last uh, 120 years has unfolded, all aimed at the same goal of trying to assure a degree of American influence or control in other parts of the world. So we talked about long-term consequences. What are some of the long-term consequences and how do they affect the average American? They affect the average American, I'd say, in two ways. One is directly, depending on the individual country, but more broadly, uh, these conflicts have left a residue of suspicion, in some cases hatred, of the United States that has undermined our long-term security interests. To give you one example, Cuba. So we went to war with Spain over possession of Cuba in 1898, and we imposed uh, a government in Cuba, despite the fact that we had promised with the force of law that as soon as the Spanish colonialists were gone, we would allow Cuba to become independent. Cubans were very upset about this. We had promised them they would become independent, but then we decided we wanted to rule there. So we did rule, uh, through Cuban proxies for 60 years. And we forgot all about the fact that we broke that promise in 1898, but the Cubans did not forget. The memories of these interventions fester and burn in the hearts and souls of the people in the target countries. So it's not a surprise that in 1959, when Fidel Castro took over Cuba, and finally installed a regime uh, hostile or unfriendly to the United States, his very first speech after he came down out of the mountains was one in which he said, this time I promise you it will not be like 1898 when the Americans came in and took over our country. So Americans wouldn't have known what he was talking about, but Cubans knew exactly. That took 60 years fester and think of what effect it has had. The Castro government spent decades working intensely and sometimes quite violently to undermine American interests all over the world. That whole chapter of history might never have happened if we had not decided we needed to intervene in Cuba so directly in the period after 1898. That's an example of how Relations with another country can go horribly wrong for a very long time as a result of an intervention that seemed to be successful when it happened. Now, we'll get into uh, some examples in addition to the, uh, the Cuban one that you just discussed uh, in a moment here. But in general, what have some of the motivations behind these regime changes been? The motivation is usually a combination of factors. Um, almost always, uh, the business or economic interest is the hook that drags the government into the regime change operation. Um, we sometimes have that, re that maxim, commerce follows the flag, but actually it's the other way around. The flag actually follows commerce. So first, business establishes itself somewhere in another country. Then that business has some kind of an argument or a dispute with that country. They come to the U.S. government, and the U.S. government then intervenes. But the government doesn't intervene usually directly on behalf of the company or the business interest. Uh, instead, the, the Americans become convinced that any government that would be bothering an American company must also be in some way hostile to the United States. So by our own definition, we're not actually intervening to protect this corporate interest. We're acting to uh, protect ourselves against a threat that this challenge to American interests reflects. So, for example, Guatemala, 1954. Um, the Guatemalan government, which was then democratic, was reflecting the will of the Guatemalan people by passing a land reform act. 
This act affected the interests of United Fruit Company, very powerful American corporation that controlled uh, large parts of the Guatemalan economy. The Guatemala, the, the United Fruit Company went to the U.S. government, with which it was intimately connected, and uh, brought the U.S. government into a plot to overthrow that democratic government. But the American government didn't do it actually uh, only on behalf of United Fruit. United Fruit managed to convince the U.S. government that actually what was happening in Guatemala was part of a strategic threat to the United States, that it was a sign that this government was communistic-oriented, that it was threatening the United States in a strategic way. And indeed, there were ties between uh, the Guatemalan government and communist governments. So... uh, our intervention was brought on by the conflict with United Fruit. Without that, it would never have happened. Without the banana company having trouble in Guatemala because of the Land Reform Act, uh, Guatemala would never even have come onto our radar screen. But once the fruit company brought it onto our radar screen, we convinced ourselves that the fact that United Fruit was having trouble in Guatemala must mean that the Guatemalan government was run by people unfriendly to the United States. So Panama has been in the news a lot. So I think it's only fair to ask a question about Panama. Could you explain the role that the U S played in the creation of Panama and the 1980s regime change there? Panama is a creation of the United States really because Theodore Roosevelt, who was president in the early part of the 20th century, wanted to create a canal across what was then a province of Colombia. Panama was part of Colombia in those days. Uh, And Roosevelt struck a deal with the Colombian government to uh, buy rights to a strip across the province of Panama. But the negotiations dragged on. The uh, Colombians seem to be bargaining a little too hard. Uh, Roosevelt lost patience. And so he fomented a little rebellion in uh, Panama. Had the people in the province of Panama declared themselves independent of Colombia, immediately recognized their province as an independent country, and actually sent a naval blockade to be sure that the Colombian government could not send troops to recuperate its province. So uh, the Republic of Panama was an artificial creation of the United States. It was created uh, so that the United States could uh, install a government that would give it what it wanted there, which was uh, the right to rule as if it were sovereign across a 10-mile strip of Central America. That's where we built the Panama Canal. Um, It was natural that after decades passed, there'd be a certain resentment growing among people in Panama that they had their country bisected from one coast to the other uh, by a 10-mile strip controlled by a foreign power. Uh, Sure enough, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, as nationalist feeling was growing in other Latin American countries, it also did in Panama. Uh, There were riots in in Panama in 1964. Several people were killed when uh, Panamanian students walked into the canal zone and uh, tried to haul up the Panamanian flag. Um, So conflict grew. And finally, uh, essentially through the statesmanship of uh, President Jimmy Carter, um, an agreement was reached to defuse what could have been a potentially very explosive situation and begin the process of turning the canal over to Panama. Uh, However, that process was soon followed by the emergence of a dictatorship or strongman rule in Panama that uh, the United States disapproved of for various reasons. And um, in 1989, there was an American invasion of Panama to overthrow that Manuel Noriega, uh, who incidentally I covered and interviewed as a correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, And uh, Panama 
has always been a uh, haven for uh, shady international financial deals. Uh, the downtown financial sec- se- uh, sector is booming. There's tremendous skyscrapers everywhere. And I think it's widely known in the world uh, as a place to go if you want to make financial deals and don't want them to be fully transparent. That's why this latest uh, brouhaha does not surprise me. Well, and in the uh, very creation of Panama, uh, we saw the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell playing a role. Uh, and the Dulles Brothers, the subject of your most recent book, had an affiliation with Sullivan and Cromwell as well. Uh, what role uh, has, has that law firm played in regime change? And also, uh, what role did the Dulles Brothers play in regime changes? The law firm Sullivan and Cromwell was quite remarkable. It wasn't really a law firm, as we think of that uh, term. Uh, it was a firm that specialized in pressuring foreign governments on behalf of American corporate clients and became very successful at that. Um, William Nelson Cromwell, one of the partners, of the uh, managing partner, was uh, heavily responsible for uh, assuring that uh, the Republic of Panama was created and that the United States decided to build its canal across Panama rather than across another route in Nicaragua. He had been hired by clients to do that. So Sullivan and Cromwell had a great role in the creation of Panama. Later on, uh, the managing partner of Sullivan and Cromwell was John Foster Dulles, who uh, went on to become Secretary of State in the 1950s and engineer many regime change operations. So he went from a job in a law firm that influenced countries around the world into a uh, a job doing it on behalf of the U.S. government. Uh, and his younger brother, Alan Dulles, at the same, uh, was also a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell and uh, went on to become a director of the CIA. So the 1950s was the only time in American history when siblings, two brothers, controlled the overt and the covert sides of American foreign policy. One was Secretary of State, the other brother was CIA director. And what roles did uh, they play in the regime changes in Iran and in Guatemala? The Dulles brothers were the principal organizers of the uh, coups in Guatemala and Iran. I think they brought grudges uh, from their practice at the law firm against uh, the leaders of both of those countries. Both of them had defied powerful clients uh, that they had represented for years as lawyers. And uh, when they came in to their jobs as head of the CIA and Secretary of State, I think they were already determined to do what they could to depose those leaders. All right. Well, just a reminder to everybody to go check out the show notes page for this episode at wakeupcallpodcast.com slash overthrow. And that will be the place to find links to Mr. Kinzer's Twitter account, uh, his website, as well as the book we've been discussing, uh, Overthrow America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. And very quickly, the schedule for the rest of the week. Tomorrow, that's Wednesday, uh, will be an interview I did with Dr. Doug McGuff on the American healthcare system and surviving it. Uh, On Thursday, uh, it'll be an episode with Daniel and I talking to Mr. Daniel McAdams about the recent announcement of uh, more U.S. troops being stationed near Russia's border. And on Friday... It will be Daniel and I speaking with Dr. Walter Block about fractional reserve banking. So that's the way the schedule looks for the rest of the week, assuming everything goes according to plan. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wake Up Call podcast. If you would like to listen to more episodes, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or subscribe on Stitcher. And check out our website at wakeupcallpodcast.com. There you will find show notes pages and comment sections dedicated to the show. You can also email us at contact at wakeupcallpodcast.com if you're interested in being interviewed for the show or have any other suggestions. Thank you.